I belong to the Theravadan tradition and so I'll talk to you about some parts of the teaching which we consider of the utmost importance on this spiritual path which is to lead us to complete freedom complete freedom from all oppression oppression which we put on ourselves now there are many aspects of the teaching and we can put one word on them in order to make it a little simpler because we have seventeen and a half thousand discourses of the Buddha that we can refer to in the Pali Canon but one word which we can put on and that's purification purification of heart and mind and without that we don't have a spiritual path the purification of heart and mind which we need to practice has definite exact guidelines given by the Buddha so we don't have to wonder and doubt how to do it it's just a matter of doing it heart and mind have to be both involved we, bo we have both if we don't involve both we are only half practicing like walking or hopping on one foot not a very good mode of transportation not only is it slow and painful but one probably stops going ahead if one had to hop on one foot we've got both we've got heart and mind so we've got to use it in the Buddhist terminology in Pali, citta depicts both. But here, in English, we have a differentiation. Mind as that which thinks rationally, logically, and understands. And heart, which feels. Now, if we have a spiritual path, it is the closest relationship that we can ever have much closer than any relationship we can have with another person but if we have a relationship with another person and only our mind is involved we understand the other person but we have no feelings for that person the relationship is doomed if we have feelings for the person but don't understand at all what's going on with him or her that also doesn't make for a very good relationship we have to understand and love even more so that's true for our spiritual path we have to understand and we have to love our understanding makes it possible to use the guidelines that the Buddha gave in order to go along that path and loving it makes it possible to self-surrender without self-surrender no meditation is possible it's the self the me that's talking when one tries to meditate if one doesn't, doesn't give up oneself completely because one has devotion and faith and a feeling of complete security one can't meditate the mind is always going to start talking again so we need the support system of the heart in the Buddhist teaching this is expressed in the five spiritual faculties which will then having been practiced 
become the five spiritual powers and are five of the 37 factors of enlightenment as the five spiritual powers. They are compared to a set of horses pulling a wagon. Now the lead horse can go as fast as it wants to or as slow, it doesn't matter. The lead horse is called mindfulness. Introspection, bear attention. And then there are two pairs. The first pair is called faith and wisdom. And they have to be balanced, which means mind and heart. Wisdom in the mind and faith in the heart. And the second pair is called energy and concentration. Now with the first pair, the Buddha gave a simile. He said he compared faith to a blind giant, very strong, who meets up with a small, very sharp-eyed cripple called wisdom. And faith says to the small, sharp-eyed cripple, I'm very strong but I can't see. You're quite weak, but you've got sharp eyes. Sit on my shoulders. Together we'll go far. We always say blind faith can move mountains. But unfortunately, being blind doesn't know which mountain needs moving. So we have to have wisdom on our shoulders, which means heart and mind. The understanding of where this practice will lead us and the understanding why each step on the way is necessary and the understanding what each step is supposed to be all about. And then the feeling in the heart which makes it possible for us to have a loving devotion a trust in something we haven't experienced yet but which will turn out all right for us It's like a child taking the mother's hand to cross a busy street. The child has trust in the mother that she'll take the child across without any mishap. The child doesn't know whether that's going to be all right or not, but there's trust there. We don't use the word faith usually. We use the word confidence or trust. Confidence in that which the Buddha taught, which we ourselves have not been able to verify yet, but because we love it, we are willing to give ourselves to it. If we don't give ourselves wholeheartedly to the practice, we'll definitely have maximal half-hearted results. If our whole heart is in it, we can expect wholehearted results. And that's not so much a matter of time. It's far more a matter of the heart. The purification, which I mentioned at the beginning, also takes place in heart and mind. And for the mind, the Buddha gave four ways of using our mind, four exact instructions. We can also use four words for it, 
which is not so difficult to remember. But this is the crux of the matter. First we have to get the information. Then we have to remember it. And only then can we practice it. So if we don't remember it, that's very little we can do. So the four words are avoiding, overcoming, developing, maintaining. And it means this in the Buddha's words. Do not let an unwholesome thought which has not yet arisen arise. Do not allow an unwholesome thought which has already arisen to remain. Make a wholesome thought which has not yet arisen arise. A wholesome thought which has already arisen should be maintained. In other words, watch every thought. The first verse in the Dhammapada says, mind is a master. There's nothing we can do, nothing at all, unless our mind tells us to. None of you would be sitting here if your mind hadn't said, come on, let's go and see what she's got to say. The body can only follow after the mind has given the orders. So we have that opportunity when we are practitioners to become aware of what our minds are doing. In our practice of meditation, in the beginning, when the mind is not very concentrated yet, we teach to label, not just thinking, 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 thinking. We know that already. We're all thinking from morning to night. That's nothing new. Content of thought, past, future, hoping, planning, remembering, disliking, boring, fantasizing, dreaming, nonsense, any label will do. That labeling process is of the utmost importance in daily life. If our meditation practice doesn't help us in daily life, we have done it in vain. That labeling that we learn, which is of course only applicable when the mind is not concentrated yet, shows us our habitual thinking pattern and it teaches us to be fully aware of the mind content. So in meditation obviously we drop whatever it was and go back to the breath or whatever meditation subject we happen to use and we learn thereby the substitution process. Substitute the thought with attention on the breath. Constant substitution until the mind is concentrated enough that this is no longer necessary. In daily life, the different story. All unwholesome thoughts can be substituted with wholesome ones. And every meditator eventually learns sooner or later that there's no justification for unwholesome thinking. Unwholesome thinking is nothing but unwholesome thinking. That's all it is. That the world doesn't function properly, well, that's a given, isn't it? I mean, what else? <laughs> that people do things which aren't right, well, of course. I mean, that's uh, understood. We don't even have to think about it. That does not give us the right for unwholesome thinking. We are not made to be judge and jury. We are here for one purpose only, for our own spiritual growth. Because if one of us grows to a spiritual stature which is meaningful, we have changed the world.
because we are the world. Each one of us is the world. Whatever we change within has changed without. So unwholesome thinking never is justified. It just is. The formula for that is recognition, no blame, change. That's all. There's no blame attached to any of this. This is the way human beings operate. And we happen to be one of them. And so we operate the same way. That's all. So what do we do? We learn the labeling. And we also learn from that labeling that any unwholesome thought, any negativity, anything negative, drags us downward, brings disquiet, is a great user of our energy. The more unwholesomeness we think, the less energy we have. If we're really tired often, that's where it comes from. It's not, it doesn't come from digging ditches comes from unwholesome thinking. But when we see that we're making ourselves unhappy and nobody else, it stands to reason that we change it. The hardest thing to do is to avoid that, to avoid the unwholesome thinking. And there, one of the clues is that every negative thought sends ahead a messenger a messenger of unpleasant feeling. Foggy, heavy, distraught. A feeling where the mind is no longer clear and bright. And because that feeling is there, we look with the mind for a reason for that and think negatively. Not necessary. As soon as this feeling arises, substitute with a different one. This is one of the most important aspects that we can learn through meditation, whether we ever get concentrated or not. Substitution of that which isn't wanted. That's avoiding. If we can't avoid, we need to overcome and then develop and maintain. Now this holds true not just for our thinking processes, but also for our emotions. And interestingly enough, most people believe that they live according to their thinking. But it's a mistaken view. Everybody lives according to their emotions. And thinking also produces emotions. Every sense contact produces feelings. Thinking is one of them, the sixth one. And because we live according to our feelings and emotions, there's nothing more important than purifying them. It is the primary pathway which leads also to good meditation. If we are upset, fearful, anxious, angry, it's impossible to meditate. The Buddha said one has to be comfortable in mind and body. Now, comfortable does not mean that one has to be flaking out, either in mind or body. But it means that there should be a feeling of ease. Then one can meditate. So, if we've got our body in fairly good order through practice, the mind needs at least that much attention. And 
our emotions, which need the most attention, are the ones that we can actually educate. All of this is a skill. All skills can be learned. The positive thinking, the wholesome thinking, is a skill like any other. The positive emotions, a skill like any other. Now, just as we have four ways of dealing with the mind, I'll repeat them, just in case you're not going to remember this. <laughs> Avoiding, overcoming, developing, maintaining. We also have four ways of dealing with our emotions. The Buddha explained that there are only four emotions worth having. The rest we can chuck out to the greatest advantage. <coughs> In Pali, these four are called metta karuna mudito pekka. The first one is usually translated as loving kindness. I don't particularly like that translation. It doesn't have enough of a charge behind it. <laughs> I like the word love. Second one is compassion. The third one is sympathetic joy, and the fourth one is equanimity. Now, under those headings, all our positive emotions are incorporated, such as generosity, gratitude, kindness, helpfulness, caring, nurturing. All of that is incorporated in those four. All the negative ones are our enemies. Now, unfortunately, just as we have a totally wrong idea very often about our negative thinking, so we have also a totally wrong idea about our emotions. With the negative thinking, we believe that we are justified because there are things that are wrong. But with our emotions, we also believe we're justified to have the negative ones because people and situations do not measure up to our ideas how they should be. If that was with an, any justification for having negative emotions, then that would mean that the world would have to be the way we figured it out. Surely that's not possible. Each one of us has figured it out differently, and there are five billion of us. So it's never going to work that way. The justification for the negativity does not exist. All that exists is the negativity. And once we get really clear about the fact that we're hurting nobody else except ourselves, that's when we start practicing. Practice starts when we watch every thought, every emotion, and substitute the unwholesome with the wholesome. Now, obviously, we're going to miss a few on the way, as long as we know that we've missed something. That's when we're practicing. Practicing is often confused with sitting on a little pillow with one's legs crossed. That's part of practice. One part of it. That's not all of it. How many hours a day can one sit on that little pillow? Everybody knows how many hours they sit. Even at the best of times, there are many hours left, huh? And what then? No practice? Nothing? Just let it all go by the wayside? That's the time to practice. Just as much as when one sits on a little pillow. Our emotions, the first one, love. Obviously, it's <coughs> far enemy is hate. That's easy to see. But the near enemy 
is affection which breeds attachment because that makes us choose where and how we're going to love we make choices based on our own viewpoints and judgments this is the way the world operates and most people operate according to the world but that's not what the buddha meant when he talked about metta metta is a pali word my tree is a sanskrit word i don't know which one you're used to let's use english love he had a totally different idea about it we have some really interesting ideas about love the first thing when we hear the word is the mind goes to a one to one relationship and then we might have maybe a few kids in the house so we have a one to two or one to three or one to four relationship and then maybe we do have an ideal most people don't but some people do have ideals and we might actually love that but what we have there is a reason for loving if it is concerned with the personal relationships whoever the people are it can never be pure for one reason only because there's fear embedded in it and fear is part of hate we don't hate the people involved but we hate the idea that we might lose them first of all we also know that everything changes although we don't want to know about it but we do know it and there's always that fear that that person or persons who are the reason for our loving may disappear they could die they could walk away they could get different ideas change their emotions all this has happened to practically everybody so with that fear embedded in the love there is no way that it can be something which is all embracing not only are we afraid that this may be lost but we are dependent upon the fact that there's somebody there who loves us now it's very nice if somebody loves us but who is the loving one then it's the other person isn't it and if we have any decent feelings we may reciprocate but in reality it has nothing to do with love it is only an arrangement by mutual consent it has one very valuable aspect but one only it can be used as a seed bed to know what it feels like to love but if it's used for that then it fulfills its purpose but if it's used as our only way of loving then we're limiting ourselves to the point where the attachment which we feel makes it impossible to have the broadening and the expansion which a really purified heart can have there are 5 billion people on this planet and we pick one and then we're afraid that one may disappear and then we quickly find another one one out of 5 billion there's more to love than that love is nothing but a quality of the heart just as intelligence is a quality of the mind now if we have an intelligent mind and in our western society that's greatly supported through all our schools and colleges universities 
then that intelligence does not disappear just because we don't happen to be using it at the moment. Maybe we are just sitting there doing nothing. We remain just as intelligent as before. With a loving heart, it's exactly the same, except that there are no schools, no colleges, no universities to teach it. If we don't teach it ourselves, we'll never learn it. It's a skill like any other. And learning it means that we become aware any time at all when our loving heart is doing exactly the opposite disliking resisting rejecting anxiety fear even hate but most of the time in daily life what we will find is that we are mildly disliking mildly resisting mildly rejecting and as long as we do that there is no self-surrender there is no devotion there is no giving oneself fully and then one need never be surprised if the mind does not get concentrated it's only possible when there is that ability to give one's love fully without any reason just because the quality of the heart is that that we can surrender our self support that we have constantly at hand because we're supporting an illusion so we need to have it on hand all the time if we can't surrender when we can't surrender, we can't meditate, we also can't love properly. The more doubt we have about the teaching, about the Buddha, about our own ability to meditate, our own ability to really purify, the more doubts we have, the less love we have. Love has no connection with who is there. Love has no connection with whether anybody is lovable. Nobody is completely lovable, including ourselves, except the Arahant, the fully enlightened one, and of those there are mighty few around. So if we want to wait for that, we'd have a long wait. We'll have to love that which exists. And the skill of learning that is part of practice. One of the discourses of the Buddha is the Karaniya Metta Sutta. Karaniya Metta Sutta, which in our tradition is chanted every morning. It's the discourse on what should be done in order to have metta, love in one's heart. And what we need to do is realize that this is an educational project like an adult education class where we are the teacher and the pupil ourselves and this educational project goes on all day all of us have constant occasion to meet other people here there and everywhere each one of these people that we meet is an object lesson in learning to love. It has absolutely nothing to do with the fact whether they're lovable. Does it have anything to do with intelligence, whether we have to solve any uh, geometric uh, solutions or anything like that? Our mind is intelligent because we've used it that way. Whether we have any philosophy to study or not makes no difference. If we want to educate ourselves on the spiritual path, this takes pride of place. The loving heart brings self-confidence. Self-confidence 
that we're not going to react unpleasantly, no matter what happens. We're not going to react hatefully, no matter what happens. We feel secure within our own feelings. Now with that self-confidence, we are assured some measure of peacefulness. That measure of peacefulness is necessary in order to start meditating properly. Because although we want to become peaceful through meditation, we need to have some peacefulness in order to get started. The churned up mind can't meditate. It doesn't have any bearing on the fact whether there is anybody around at all. The loving heart is a heart which gives of itself it is the great generosity of the heart. It is that what we can give no matter whether we own anything, whether we have any money, whether we have any gifts to give. Our love can be given. And if that is our understanding that this needs to be done, we can practice. Every person we meet is an opportunity to practice. And since all of us meet a lot of people, we have a lot of opportunities to practice. The Buddha compared being angry with someone to picking up hot coals with one's bare hands and trying to throw them. Who gets burned first? And if we throw them at a practitioner, that person might be smart enough to duck. So throwing hot coals in anger is useless. He compared hate or ill will with a bilious disease, the bile's coming up. And he also compared it to a pond where the wind is blowing so strongly that it makes a lot of waves and one can't see one's own likeness. When we're angry and upset, we don't know anymore what we're doing. We're just angry, that's all. One of the things that is practiced in this tradition and which we'll do at the end of my talk is loving kindness meditation. The guided meditation, we'll do it together to give you an idea what it is. But again, that too is not enough. Because although it puts the mind in the right direction, there are too many hours of the day, every single day, where the mind might go in the wrong direction. This is one of the interesting aspects of the Buddha's teaching, that we have to deliberately put the mind in the right direction so that it will go there. Meditators usually know that they don't have to believe their thoughts. They just come and they go. They're not wanted. Well, exactly that is in daily life with thoughts and emotion. They just come and they just go. They don't have to be believed. If they're unwholesome, unskillful, we don't need to keep them. If we become aware of what goes on within, how often we reject and resist and dislike and tell a story of how justified that is, and we will really become aware of that in our daily lives. We will see that we are only hurting ourselves. We are not our own best friend. In fact, many people are their own best enemies. Nobody can make us happy. Only we ourselves. There is nothing out there. There is only the reaction in here. Lovingness in the heart is not a matter of meeting the right people, 
not a matter of knowing a lot. It's not a matter of having been loved by someone. It's not a matter of having had no suffering. Nobody is immune from that. It's strictly a matter of educating the heart. For the simple reason that we have seen quite clearly, that's the only sensible thing to do. Heart and mind have to work together. When the mind knows this is a sensible thing to do, then we start working on it. And as we work on it, we will find that very often we'll have to substitute. We feel angry at somebody. And we realize this isn't going to work. So we substitute. We see in that person all the good things that we have overlooked at that moment. The Buddha called that the five noble powers. In Pali, those are idis, powers, noble powers, Arya idis. In Sanskrit, they're siddhis. Now that's a word that is not so unknown even in our language because siddhis are usually believed to be supernatural powers in the days of the Buddha and today. And in some traditions, you can even pay money for learning cities. The Buddha said, no, those are not the powers, not those supernatural ones. He said, I'll tell you what the, super, what the great powers are, the noble powers are. He said, to see in the lovely, also the not lovely, to see in the non-lovely, the lovely. To see in both, both sides. And for the Arahant, the enlightened one, no longer either one or the other. He said, these are the great powers. This is how we have inner power. Power is not something we have over others. Power is something we have over ourselves power over our instincts and impulses, over our negativities. When we get that power, then we're powerful. And then we're independent. Not that we don't have anything to do with other people, but we're independent of their emotions. Our emotions remain the same. We're independent of the contact that come through their speech. Our emotions remain the same. So to have those powers of seeing that which is non-desirable in what we think is so desirable saves us from greed. And to see that which is desirable in what we think is so non-desirable saves us from hate. So we can see both sides in everything. And most of the troubles that people have come with other people, isn't it? Cats and dogs don't answer back, and trees and flowers are usually <coughs> well-liked, and so are butterflies and birds. But it's other people, whether they are the ones that we live with, or the ones that we know about, or the ones that we read about, that's the ones we have trouble with. The person we have the most trouble with, of course, is the one that we are calling me. And as long as we're having trouble with me, we can be guaranteed to have trouble with others. So the thing to do is, of course, to start loving oneself. And loving oneself does not mean indulging oneself. That's usually following one's sense desires also happens. But loving oneself is not following one's sense desires. Loving oneself is being contented with who we are, where we are, what we're doing, how we're feeling, all the things that make up this person we call me. Contentment and a feeling of warmth and caring, feeling of being concerned 
and nurturing. Combining knowing what's good for oneself with loving. So if we start with ourselves, we've got a practice person right there all the time, haven't we? You don't have to wait till somebody comes along. And that is the person we have to learn it from. So we start with seeing how we can love ourselves in spite of all the things that we know about ourselves. And if we manage that nicely, we'll manage to love anybody. Because what we know about ourselves will be far kind of love that the Buddha is talking about has nothing to do with choice or judgment. It has nothing to do with abilities. It is strictly learning to use one's heart in the one way which matters. Our heart has only one function and that's loving. All the other functions that it also performs are usually misplaced. Compassion is the second one of those four supreme emotions. They are called the supreme emotions, just as the one about thinking are called the supreme efforts. Compassion as its far enemy has, of course, cruelty. That's easy to see. But as its near enemy, it has pity. And that's not so easy to see because they're very similar. But pity is separating ourselves from another. We're sorry for the other person, but deep down inside, we're quite glad that it didn't happen to us. Pity is also a feeling of separation where we are here and the other person's over there. Whereas compassion As the word says, com means with, passion is feeling, empathy, with feeling. And again, it starts within us. Finding within us enough dukkha, which is all-pervading. Everybody know the word dukkha? Everybody knows the feeling. It's just the word. Having found that within and being able to have compassion for ourselves because it's very difficult to be a human being and even more difficult to be a good human being. And then understanding that, having compassion for all our own difficulties, we learn to have compassion for everybody else's difficulties. Having found a way out of some of our difficulties through practice, we may be able to show a way out to others. But we can only help another as far as we have already helped ourselves. One of the great support systems for actually loving other people and loving oneself and having compassion for others and compassion for oneself is the meditative experiences of unity. The meditative experiences of unity where there is no separation between oneself and anything else that exists. These experiences come through concentration and sometimes are mild and sometimes stronger. When they're stronger, they're the meditative absorptions, one part of them. And having experienced that, even just once, one has the personal knowledge that this separation which we see, where everybody is a separate person sitting here as a separate little heap, is nothing but an optical illusion. It's so strong that we are drawn into it completely. 
But can we really believe only that what we see with our physical eyes? Our physical eyes are very poor tools. We cannot look around a corner. We can't see beyond the horizon. And we can't even see ultraviolet light, which bees can see. And yet we believe what we see with these physical eyes. It's a totally optical illusion that all of us are separate. We're all influencing each other. We're all dependent upon one another. Just for a moment, go over in your mind how many people you need in everyday life to just to sustain life. Somebody's got to grow the food. Somebody's got to work at this electric substation. Somebody's got to do something about the telephone connections. Somebody's got to make clothing. Somebody makes glasses. There's no end to it. If you want to get a letter, you have to have it delivered. Somebody's got to do something. We're so interdependent, we couldn't live without that. But not only that, we are influencing ourselves with all the around us constantly through the feelings, the emotions, the thoughts that go on. And even more so, we probably all know that our scientists have said many decades ago that they have made experiments in the bubble chamber and found that there aren't any solid building blocks in the whole of the universe. They are nothing but energy particles falling apart and coming back together again. And having seen that in the bubble chamber, if they had also included themselves, they would have been enlightened by now. But since they didn't, they're probably still doing the same thing they did 30 years ago. But we can use that knowledge by trying to experience it and live it. All of us in this together, including all nature around us, every bit of it, all one manifestation. If that is a meditative experience, love and compassion come much easier. If it isn't a meditative experience, we'll have to work on it a little harder. But work on it, we've got to do. If we are interested in a spiritual path, and one would assume that all of us are, there's only one thing to do with it, and that is grow on that path. And we can only grow if we purify. Because as long as all the obstructions, obscurations, hindrances are cluttered up in our mind and heart, how can we grow? There's no way that there's any place, any opening to go and expand and enlarge. Unlimited infinite these are words the Buddha used our mind and minds and hearts have that capacity and ability we can get it by working on it our meditative practice is one of the tools the rest we have to do in daily life at 24 hours in a day we might sleep six, 18 hours left. How many do we sit? Three, four, five, two, one, whatever. How many are left? 15 hours left, 14 hours left. Well, that's practice. We live daily lives. That's all we're living. The rest are all our tools, our ways of doing it. Every single moment of concentration in meditation is one moment of purification. 
So whether we can concentrate one second or ten, half an hour or two, all of it is purification. Because at that moment, no negativity can arise. Luckily, we can only do one thing at a time. We can do it in very quick succession. The Buddha said we can have 3,000 mind moments in the blink of an eyelid. Luckily, we don't have that many usually. But just imagine. That's why it all goes on like that in the mind. But one moment of concentration is one moment of purification. One moment of mindfulness, which means knowing what's going on inside, being objective observer, recognizing what it is, is a moment of purification. Then substituting for the wholesome, another moment. The more moments come together, the more purification. When the mind and the heart are purified, there are no obstacles, no limitations. We can feel that there's only manifestation then. And then freedom and independence can come from that. Maybe you have some questions. If you like to ask some questions, I'll try and answer them. Yes. So, um, um, perceiving a negative thought formation, yeah. from the feeling of fog behind me, mm-hmm. and that precise feeling, is that when you so persist or positive, you bring up a positive thought or positive thought? If you can. If you can. Uh, this is very often the uh, a starting point for the negative thought. But if you become aware of that feeling, you bring up a positive thought at that time, yes. And then you've avoided the negative thought. Yes. What is heart? You referred to the heart. Feeling, emotion, yes. emotion. Yeah. You see, in the, in the Buddhist terminology, in Pali, the word is citta. And chitta consists of four parts, which is the sense consciousness, which is seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, smelling, then the feeling, then the perception, which is the labeling, and then the mental formation, which is the reaction. So the feeling is is included in that. But for us in English, it's much easier if we separate the two. And we think of thinking as mind and of emotion as heart. Anything else? Yes. Yeah. Um, about the uh, substitution, uh, you had said that um, it was important that we know ourselves and our habitual ways of thinking. And what occurred to me is that possibly if I substitute too soon <laughs> or as it comes up, would, would I not? Uh, maybe understand that path where I get into my habitual pattern before I move on and then, yeah. Mm. Uh, The quicker we substitute from the negative to the positive, the better off we are. Because you can think of it like this. The The mind is very easily influenced. It's, uh, you make ruts into the mind. And the more negativities come up in the mind, the easier it is to continue that. And the more we allow it, the more we do it. So the quicker we substitute to the positive, the less of a deep rut we have made. The mind is a jewel. It contains the seed of enlightenment. We should treat it like a jewel. If you have a really valuable, brilliant, beautiful jewel in your home, you're not going to allow it to get dirty. And if it should get dirty by mistake, you clean it up again. And that's the same with the mind. And the quicker we clean it, the better it is. Anything else? Yes. Um, 
you talk about that when there's confusion, that means there's a negative thought or feeling arising? I guess. When there is confusion, are you saying, is that a negative yes. thought? Confusion like what? Can you give me an example? Uh, confusion of not knowing what to do. Hmm. Uncertainty. Should I do this or should yeah. I do that? Okay, that's I uncertainty. Think, yeah. mm. That's a fifth hindrance. Skeptical doubt. Doubt. Is doubt. doubt? Mm. Yes. Uh, doubt is also um, connected to hate. We have the two major problems, which are hate and greed. And then they have all these uh, categories that belong under that. So doubt is also the under that because it's also connected to fear I might be doing the wrong thing so there's fear in, in, in the mind of that so doubt the Buddha compared doubt to wandering in the desert without a road map and without any provisions and therefore going around in circles and in the end being overrun by bandits so the antidote which he um, recommended for that is learning more about the Dhamma, in other words, learning more about the Buddha's teaching, and having wise companions and noble friends and noble conversations. Because if we can, and this is called clear comprehension, in Pali, mindfulness is called sati, and it always goes together with Sampanyanya, which is mindfulness and clear comprehension. And clear comprehension is a kind of understanding which makes it possible to see quite clearly what the Buddha would have said or what he would have done or what he actually did say or what he actually did do so that we could use that as a guideline. The Buddha said about himself, I'm only the shower of the way. And never could we, could anybody do this for us. But since he showed us a way, if we have a remembrance of it, if we can remember, if we have wise companions who could tell us something, the doubt eventually disintegrates. I think there's something like you try to make plans, like you make plans to come to the United States, and uh, of course, you know, by the time you get here, the causes and conditions have changed you know, someplace, and so uh, is there a point when, uh, you know, of course there's a point when you say, well, those plans aren't working, but is there, you know, that's what I'm thinking, of some confusion when, uh, you know, plans don't work, and perhaps the next action, uh, it doesn't seem apparent. And plans don't work. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, what kind of plans? The plans that are made to to live in with Dhamma, teach Dhamma, listen to Dhamma, they usually work. Yeah. They have very little uh, difficulty in them. Um, in fact, they work so well that uh, that one is uh, sometimes surprised. Uh, the things that don't work is sometimes making money and that type of thing. That doesn't work often. Well, one has to think about it again, look at it, what's wrong. And that's part of clear comprehension. Okay, I'll give you the, the four parts of clear comprehension. If you can remember them, they're very, very good to use. Clear comprehension means that one examines the purpose of what one is thinking, saying, or wanting to do. What's the purpose? Then one examines how one is going to do it. Are these the most skillful means in order to accomplish the purpose? Third step, are means and purpose within the Dhamma? For that you have to know some Dhamma. What did the Buddha say? Right. Then, okay, everything is positive. Purpose is all right. The skillful means are all right. Everything is in the Dhamma because there's no end that justifies means. Means and end have to be within the Dhamma. And then you go ahead with it and then it doesn't work and then you look if my purpose was not fulfilled why not and then you look and see why not what I do wrong what 
went wrong? What did I not fulfill? So this uh, this is the everyday kind of clear comprehension. There's another one which is deeper going, but that would go too far in just a short time. But that's an everyday kind of clear comprehension which is very useful. Can you remember? Hmm? Purpose means in Dhamma, and if no purpose was not fulfilled, why not? Yes. What's your favorite uh, English translation for dukkha? Unsatisfactoriness. Mm-hmm. It's uh, it is um, suffering, pain, grief, and lamentation, birth, decay, and death. But it is essentially unsatisfactoriness arising out of the fact that everything is impermanent. So I like unsatisfactoriness. Yeah. Yes. Western psychology and psychiatry tells us that if you uh, if you use your power of mind to keep an unwholesome thought from arising, uh, they call that, I think, suppression or, or mm-hmm. some such way, and leads to various kinds of mental illnesses. Um, and the second way of dealing with unwholesome thoughts that have arisen uh, seems to be very close to the what I understand the Mahayana teaching of, of not uh, really interfering with uh, unwholesome thoughts uh, in the sense that if you react to any, anything that you do uh, about an unwholesome thought or indeed a wholesome thought is a karma, a karmic activity and, uh, and that uh, if you can somehow fully permit I am afraid I think you have misunderstood that because the thought itself is a karmic activity already whether you interfere or not the thought is a karmic activity and if you think unwholesomely you're making bad karma it seems in my life that thoughts and feelings are something which come without a lot of volition and where the volition comes in is what I do. And, and that's why. Yes. It may appear to you that your thoughts and your feelings arise without volition. But the negative ones come because of hate and greed. And the positive ones come because of love, compassion, and generosity. And whether you're aware of that or not, it really, in, the, in your karmic resultants, makes no difference whatsoever. You see, when one becomes extremely concentrated and has and uses that concentration for this uh, pinpointed mindfulness on oneself, one can become aware that these unwholesome thoughts and unwholesome uh, reactions in the emotion are due to either greed or hate. One can actually become aware of that. Although it all happens so quickly that it appears as if it was automatic. But if it is automatic, then we can't change. It doesn't. It doesn't follow, in my my in my understanding, anyway. It doesn't follow that because that there is a cause that there is necessarily uh, a present time volition. No. I don't think so. Maybe you know, I would suggest in that case that next time you have a negative thought investigate why it came, right? And when you find out why it came, then you have the answer to the volition. I mean, what you are uh, proposing is that there is no karma. Why, for jealous people, uh, the why of jealousy is, 
essentially irrelevant uh, at, at the moment. Um, the difficult part is dealing with the what, with the actual occurrence. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, so that's why I, I mean, that's my purpose in raising this uh, question. Well, if I remember what you said at the beginning correctly, you said not to interfere with it. Mm. So you l would let the jealousy be there. Yes, well, unfortunately, you have used, uh, if you're using jealousy, that's one of those things that when it dissipates, it uh, very often re-arises, doesn't it? Yeah, and then you just want to wait for it to go away again until one day it goes away entirely. It's a long-term proposition. A little, some vega is missing. <laughs> Urgency. It's urgent now, not in the future got to be done now. Purification happens now. And it's a deliberate way of getting one's mind and one's heart on the, in the right direction and following the uh, guidelines that the Buddha gave for that, how to do it. It's strictly a how-to. The, the easiest one, the one which is the, the least complicated, is dropping. But because it's at least complicated, but because most people can't do that, they need substitution. But to wait till one day, there's no more hate and no more greed. I'm afraid it's wishful thinking. There is no such thing. We've got to do it. It's each to up to each individual. It doesn't just disappear. Because, you see, if jealousy happens to be the problem, if somebody is easily jealous, and then, or even jealousy goes together with envy, eh? so then one envy is <laughs> disappeared. You can find a new one, no? That is so, and of course, it's true. <laughs> well, if, if, if not, if you're not talking about that, then I have not understood you. <laughs> yes. Uh, I take jealousy. Isn't uh, awareness, complete awareness, itself a transforming act? Mm -hmm. uh, so jealousy arises uh, to, com to completely uh, allow it into awareness with equanimity, which is, of course, difficult for one, it's jealousy, but let's assume for a second. Uh, then that's that. I mean, the transformation... No, no, no. Um, uh, awareness is objective mindfulness. If you have objective mindfulness of that arising, that objective mindfulness takes the place of the jealousy. Mm -hmm. That means you've dropped it yeah. and substituted with objective mindfulness. It's one moment of purification. Uh, but it, so that's, that's... That's dropping. Within, that's within your definition of replacing. No. That's, yes, but it's a dropping. Yeah, but that's dropping and replacing. Are kind no, of the, the replacing is something far more deliberate. Uh -huh. It's uh, having become aware of the jealousy, but not being able to just let go because you're not objective. When you're totally objective and see it just arising and ceasing, nothing to it, just drop it. But... When you can't do that, then you have to substitute with something which is positive. Because it's, most people can't. Most people cannot be objective towards their own emotional and mental states. It takes quite a lot of learning. Mm. Um, when you, know, again, you were talking, uh, I think that maybe the compassion comes in there, to be able to be completely objective and aware, uh, you need to have a lot of compassion, otherwise you can't get to that state. To be completely objective and aware, to be completely objective and aware towards yourself, I would say, 
needs an experience of no self because only then do you become really objective. Uh, to be compassionate towards yourself would probably help, but it will not necessarily make it possible to drop the unwholesome thinking or the unwholesome emotion. The unwholesome emotion, as long as you identify with the unwholesome emotion, it's me being jealous. So long you've got a problem. Right? But when you become totally objective towards this, this has arisen so it ceases. And you can drop it. It's not you, it's not yours. Then you can do it. But otherwise, if it's, as long as there's any identification, it's me being jealous. Then deliberate substitution is necessary. Otherwise, it just doesn't go away. In fact, even with deliberate substitution, you might have to do it more than once. <laughs> yes? But doesn't that deliberate substitution have the danger of an attachment rather than being aware of this sort of created machine that you are from the habits and patterns that you've absorbed? <coughs> and, and, and instead of saying, I will become an unattached from that, I will know that machine, I will have compassion for the way that it is, and I will let it cease to dominate me, you're saying, perhaps, no, I will reprogram this machine. I will, I will wipe things away. But doesn't that cause another form of attachment which can keep you from freedom? Well, uh, <laughs> even if it did, that would be a better attachment than most things that people are attached to. Um, <laughs> the purification system is the necessary stepping t are the necessary stepping stones towards reaching a stage where you can actually let go of this un this illusion that there's somebody there and that's when you let go of that being attached to me but these are the stepping stones towards that okay right yeah you think that uh somebody who had not worked on this purification of emotions and so on that we're talking about now can have a real absorption in meditation? Or if somebody reports to you, uh, you see a student, say, who is obviously uh, very confused about their emotions and so on, and they come and they report to you, I, I have good concentration mm -hmm. in meditation. Does this happen or is there something hidden in their concentration. looks like concentration, but it's not real concentration. Well, they can get to the first one, even with confusion. Um, but they can't stay with it. Uh, they can get to it. And most meditators have been there. Even though nobody told them it's the first jhana, they've been there. Um, those that have meditated for some time, the minute they get it explained, they say, oh, I know that one. So um, most meditators can do that, uh, even with no end of confusion <laughs> but uh, they usually can't go any further they certainly can't get to three and four and further on and uh, even the second one not so is it a kind of like a, a relationship between the, the experience of meditation and the daily life that as you purify more you can deepen concentration absolutely and then the other way around. as you deepen concentration you have more access to, to be able to purify more in your emotional life Right, yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. They constantly in intermingle the two, yeah. constantly. You see, the, the meditation itself purifies you, the jhanas purify you the most, because you can stay with them. And so the, the purification uh, that goes on then is really strong. But if you've done it in daily life, you've got an entry. And as you get the entry, and also... It's been my experience that most meditators, I would say practically all, who have done some years of meditation have purified to the extent where the first jhana is totally accessible because it's a very um, low-grade jhana. <laughs> it's totally accessible. So, yes, it's a, the whole thing is a purification system all the way through. And in the beginning, and I mean for years, for quite a number of years, we've got to do it de deliberately. Nobody's going to do it for us. And all the problems that arise, with, which we have within, arise out of the non-purification 
obviously. Do it is hard to live with. <laughs> Anything else? Yes. Well, getting back to uh, art. Yes. Uh, this afternoon, I was uh, I was reading a, a passage, uh, uh, and it was written by a teacher of, of not only another tradition but another religion, uh, who used exactly the same definition for art as, as you did, which is very interesting. Um, what he was saying, though, was that that often, uh, you know, these days we talk about, I followed my heart, or my, my heart told me to do this. And he cautioned against that because the heart, being only feelings and emotions, does not have intelligence or discriminating awareness of its own and can be linked very closely with desire mm -hmm. so that, in fact, we can, um, we can actually fool ourselves into acting on desires mm -hmm. by telling ourselves, oh, I, I mm -hmm. listen to my heart, and that, that it's very important to balance that out mm -hmm. with uh, almost the intellectual side, but you know, certainly the wisdom. I, I was, and that just kind of opened up many thoughts mm -hmm. for me that I, I never really thought of that before. Uh, could you comment on that? Yes, well, I saw a, a car sticker once here in America, and it said, if it feels good, it must be right. And I thought to myself, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> That's really dangerous. That's why the Buddha said the four supreme emotions, love, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. All the other, I follow my heart, sure, can easily be desire, certainly. But if it's love, which is giving, compassion, which is giving, joy with us, In order to start, please put the attention on the breath for just a few moments. Now imagine you have a beautiful white lotus flower growing in your heart which opens all its petals until it's fully open and a golden stream of light comes out of the center of the lotus flower and fills you from head to toe with warmth with joy, with contentment, and it surrounds you with love, giving you a feeling of being cared for. A feeling of being secure. Put your attention on the person sitting nearest you in this room and let the golden stream of light from the center of your heart reach out to that person, filling him or her with the warmth from your heart, the care, concern, surrounding that person with your love.
put your attention on everyone who is assembled here and let the golden stream of light from the center of your heart reach out to everyone's heart filling everyone with warmth with your care your concern your love Think of your parents, whether they're still alive or not, and let the golden stream of light from the center of your heart reach out to them, filling them with your gratitude, your love, surrounding them with a sense of being cared for. Think of those people who are nearest and dearest to you, those that you may live with. Let the golden stream of light from the center of your heart reach out to them, filling them with the warmth from your heart, the joy and peacefulness, embracing them with your love without expecting the same in return. Now think of all your good friends. Let them arise before your mind's eye and let the golden stream of light from the center of your heart reach out to their hearts, bringing them the depth and sincerity of your friendship, the warmth from your heart, your care and concern without expecting the same in return. Think of all those people who are part of your life every day. 
or very often those you see and talk to let the golden stream of light from the center of your heart reach out to all these people's hearts filling them with the best your heart can give warmth and care concern and love Think of any person in your life whom you find difficult to love, with whom you may have had some problems. 